Chapter 19. Annabeth. They didn't make it to the ship. Halfway across the dock, three giant eagles descended in front of them. Each deposited a Roman commando in purple and denim with glittering gold armour, sword and shield. The eagles flew away, and the Roman in the middle, who was scrawnier than the others, raised his visor. Surrender to Rome, Octavian shrieked. Hazel drew her cavalry sword and grumbled. Fat chance, Octavian. Annabeth cursed under her breath. By himself, the skinny auger wouldn't have bothered her, but the two other guys looked like seasoned warriors, a lot bigger and stronger than Annabeth wanted to deal with, especially since Piper and she were armed only with daggers. Piper raised her hands in a placating gesture. Octavian, what happened at camp was a setup. We can explain. Can't hear you, Octavian yelled. Wax in our ears. Standard procedure when battling evil sirens. Now, throw down your weapons and turn around slowly so I can bind your hands. Let me skewer him, Hazel muttered. Please. The ship was only fifty feet away, but Annabeth saw no sign of Coach Hedge on deck. He was probably below, watching his stupid martial arts programs. Jason's group wasn't due back until sunset, and Percy would be underwater, unaware of the invasion. If Annabeth could get on board, she could use the ballastay, but there was no way to get around these free Romans. She was running out of time. The eagles circled overhead, crying out as if to alert their brethren. Hey, some tasty Greek demigods over here. Annabeth couldn't see the flying chariot any more, but she assumed it was close by. She had to figure out something before more Romans arrived. She needed help, some kind of distress signal to Coach Hedge, or even better, Percy. Well, Octavian demanded, his two friends brandished their swords. Very slowly, using only two fingers, Annabeth drew her dagger. Instead of dropping it, she tossed it as far as she could into the water. Octavian made a squeaking sound. What was that for? I didn't say toss it. That could have been evidence. Or spoils of war. Annabeth tried for a dumb blonde smile like, oh, silly me. Nobody who knew her would have been fooled, but Octavian seemed to buy it. He huffed in exasperation. You other two. He pointed his blade at Hazel and Piper. Put your weapons on the dock. No funny biz... All around the Romans, Charleston Harbour erupted like a Las Vegas fountain putting on a show. When the wall of seawater subsided, the three Romans were in the bay, spluttering and frantically trying to stay afloat in their armour. Percy stood on the dock, holding Annabeth's dagger. You drop this, he said, totally poker-faced. Annabeth threw her arms around him. I love you. Guys, Hazel interrupted. She had a little smile on her face. We need to hurry? Down in the water, Octavian yelled. Get me out of here. I'll kill you. Tempting, Percy called down. What? Octavian shouted. He was holding to on to one of his guards, who was having trouble keeping them both afloat. Nothing, Percy shouted back. Let's go, guys. Hazel frowned. We can't let them drown, can we? They won't, Percy promised. I've got the water circulating around their feet. As soon as we're out of range, I'll spit them ashore. Piper grinned. Nice. They climbed aboard the Argo too, and Annabeth ran to the helm. Piper, get below. Use the sink in the galley for an iris message. Warn Jason to get back here. Piper nodded and raced off. Hazel, go find Coach Hedge and tell him to get his furry hindquarters on deck. Right. And Percy, you and I need to get this ship to Fort Sumter. Percy nodded and ran to the mast. Annabeth took the helm. Her hands flew across the controls. She'd just have to hope she knew enough to operate them. Annabeth had seen Percy control full-size sailing ships before with only his willpower. This time he didn't disappoint. Ropes flew on their own, releasing the dock ties, weighing the anchor. The sails unfurled and caught the wind. Meanwhile, Annabeth fired the engine. The oars extended with a sound like a machine gun fire, and the Argo too turned from the dock, heading for the island in the distance. The three eagles still circled overhead, but they made no attempt to land the ship, probably because Festus, the figurehead, blew fire whenever they got close. More eagles were flying in formation towards Fort Sumter, at least a dozen. If each of them carried a Roman demigod, that was a lot of enemies. Coach Hedge came pounding up the stairs with Hazel at his hooves. Where are they? he demanded. Who do I kill? No killing, Annabeth ordered. Just defend the ship. But they interrupted a Chuck Norris movie. Piper emerged from below. Got a message through to Jason. Kind of fuzzy, but he's already on his way. He should be... Oh, there. Soaring over the city, heading in their direction, was a giant bald eagle, unlike the golden Roman, mer Roman birds. Frank, Hazel said. Leo was holding on to the eagle's feet, and even from the ship, Annabeth could hear him screaming and cursing. Behind them flew Jason, riding the wind. Never seen Jason fly before, Percy grumbled. He looks like a blonde Superman. This isn't the time, Piper scolded him. Look, they're in trouble. Sure enough, the Roman flying chariot had descended from a cloud and was diving straight towards them. Jason and Frank veered out of the way, pulling up to avoid getting trampled by the pegasi. 
The charioteers fired their bows. Arrows whistled under Leo's feet, which led to more screaming and cursing. Jason and Frank were forced to overshoot the Argo too and fly towards Fort Sumter. I'll get them, yelled Coach Hedge. He spun the port ballista. Before Annabeth could yell, don't be stupid, Hedge fired. A flaming spear rocketed towards the chariot. It exploded over the heads of the Pegasi and threw them into a panic. Unfortunately, it also singed Frank's wings and sent him spiralling out of control. Leo slipped from his grasp. The char chariot shot towards Fort Sumter, slamming into Jason. Annabeth watched in horror as Jason, obviously dazed and in pain, lunged for Leo, caught him and then struggled to gain altitude. He only managed to slow their fall. They disappeared behind the ramparts of the fort. Frank tumbled after them. Then the chariot dropped somewhere inside and hit with a bone-chattering crack. One broken wheel spun into the air. Coach! Piper screamed. What? Hedge demanded. That was just a warning shot. Annabeth gunned the engines. The hull shuddered as they picked up speed. The docks of the island were only a hundred yards away now, but a dozen more eagles were soaring overhead, each carrying a Roman demigod in its claws. The Argo 2's crew would be outnumbered at least three to one. Percy, Annabeth said, we're going to come in hard. I need you to control the water so we don't smash into the docks. Once we're there, you're going to have to hold off the attackers. The rest of you, help him guard the ship. But Jason, Piper said. Frank and Leo, Hazel added. I'll find them, Annabeth promised. I've got to figure out where the map is, and I'm pretty sure I'm the only one who can do that. The fort is crawling with Romans, Percy warned. You'll have to fight your way through, find our friends, assuming they're okay, find this map and get everybody back alive, all on your own? Just an average day. Annabeth kissed him. Whatever you do, don't let them take this ship. Chapter 20. Annabeth. The new civil war had begun. Leo had somehow survived his fall unharmed. Annabeth saw him ducking from portico to portico, blasting fire at the giant eagle swooping down on him. Roman demigods tried to chase him, tripping over piles of cannonballs and dodging tourists, who screamed and ran in circles. Tour guides kept yelling, It's just a reenactment! Though they didn't sound sure, the mist could only do so much to change what mortals saw. In the middle of the courtyard, a full-grown elephant, could that be Frank, rampaged around the flagpole, scattering Roman warriors. Jason stood about fifty yards away, sword-fighting with a stocky centurion, whose lips were stained cherry red, like blood. A wannabe vampire, or maybe a Kool-Aid freak. As Annabeth watched, Jason yelled, Sorry about this, Dakota! He vaulted straight over the centurion's head like an acrobat and slammed the hilt of his gladius into the back of the Roman's head. Dakota crumpled. Jason, Annabeth called. He scanned the battlefield until he saw her. She pointed to where the Argo too was docked. Get the others aboard. Retreat. What about you? He called. Don't wait for me. Annabeth bolted off before he could protest. She had a hard time manoeuvring through the mobs of tourists. Why did so many people want to see Fort Sumter on a sweltering summer day? But Annabeth quickly realised the crowds had saved their lives. Without the chaos of all those panicked mortals, the Romans would have already surrounded their outnumbered crew. Annabeth dodged into a small room that must have been part of the garrison. She tried to steady her breathing. She imagined what it would have been like to be a Union soldier on this island in 1861, surrounded by enemies, dwindling food and supplies, no reinforcements coming. Some of the Union defenders had been children of Athena. They'd hidden an important map here, something they didn't want falling into enemy hands. If Annabeth had been one of those demigods, where would she have put it? Suddenly the walls glistened, the air became warm. Annabeth wondered if she was hallucinating. She was about to run for the exit when the door slammed shut. The mortar between the stones blistered. The bubbles popped and thousands of tiny black spiders swelled forth. Annabeth couldn't move. Her heart seemed to have stopped. The spiders blanketed the walls, crawling over one another, spreading across the floor and gradually surrounding her. It was impossible. This couldn't be real. Terror plunged into her, in her into memories. She was seven years old again, alone in her bedroom in Richmond, Virginia. The spiders came at night. They crawled in waves from her closet and waited in the windows and the shadows. She yelled for her father, but her father was away at f for work. He always seemed to be away for work. Her stepmother came instead. I don't mind being the bad cop, she had once told Annabeth's father, when she didn't think Annabeth could hear. It's only your imagination, her stepmother said about the spiders. You're scaring your baby brothers. They're not my brothers, Annabeth argued which made her stepmother's expression harden. Her eyes were almost as scary as the spider's. Go to sleep now, her stepmother insisted. No more screaming. The spiders came back as soon as her stepmother had left the room. Annabeth tried to hide under the covers, but it was no good. 
Eventually, she fell asleep from sheer exhaustion. She woke up in the morning, freckled with bites, cobwebs covering her eyes, her mouth and nose. The bites faded before she even got dressed, so she had nothing to show her stepmother except cobwebs, which her stepmother thought was some sort of clever trick. No more talk of spiders, her stepmother said firmly. You're a big girl now. The second night the spiders came again. Her stepmother continued to be the bad cop. Annabeth wasn't allowed to call her father and bother him with this nonsense. No, he would not come home early. The third night, Annabeth ran away from home. Later at Camp Halfblood, she learned that all children of Athena feared spiders. Long ago, Athena had taught the mortal weaver, Arachne, a hard lesson, cursing her for pride by turning her into the first spider. Ever since, spiders had hated the children of Athena. But that didn't make her fear easier to deal with. Once, she'd almost killed Connor Stoll at camp for putting a tarantula in her bunk. Years later, she'd had a panic attack at a water park in Denver when she and Percy were assaulted by mechanical spiders. And the past few weeks, Annabeth had dreamed of spiders almost every night, crawling over her, suffocating her, wrapping her in webs. Now, standing in the barracks at Fort Sumter, she was surrounded. Her nightmares had come true. A sleepy voice murmured in her head, Soon, my dear, you will meet the weaver soon. Gaia? Annabeth murmured. She feared the answer, but she asked, Who? Who is the weaver? The spiders became excited, swarming over the walls, swirling around Annabeth's feet like a glistening black whirlpool. Only the hope that it might be an illusion kept Annabeth from passing out from fear. I hope you survive, child, the woman's voice said. I would prefer you as my sacrifice, but we must let the weaver take her revenge. Gaia's voice faded. On the far wall in the centre of the spider swarm, a red symbol blazed to life. The figure of an owl, like the one on the silver drachma, staring straight at Annabeth. Then, just as in her nightmares, the mark of Athena burned across the walls, incinerating the spiders until the room was empty except for the smell of sickly sweet ashes. Go, said a new voice. Annabeth's mother, avenge me. Follow the mark. The blazing symbol of the owl faded. The garrison door burst open. Annabeth stood stunned in the middle of the room, unsure whether she'd seen something real or just a vision. An explosion shook the building. Annabeth remembered that her friends were in danger. She'd stayed here much too long. She forced herself to move, still trembling. She stumbled outside. The ocean air helped clear her mind. She gazed across the courtyard, past the panicked tourists and fighting demigods, to the edge of the battlements, where a large mortar pointed out to sea. It might have been Annabeth's imagination, but the old artillery piece seemed to be glowing red. She dashed towards it. An eagle swooped at her, but she ducked and kept running. Nothing could possibly scare her as much as those spiders. Roman demigods had formed ranks and were advancing towards the Argo too, but a miniature storm had gathered over their heads. Though the day was clear all, all around them, thunder rumbled and lightning flashed above the Romans. Rain and wind pushed them back. Annabeth didn't stop to think about it. She reached the mortar and put her hand on the muzzle. On the plug that blocked the opening, the mark of Athena began to glow, the red outline of an owl. In the mortar, she said, of course. She pulled at the plug with her fingers. No luck. Cursing, she drew her dagger. As soon as the celestial bronze touched the plug, the plug shrank and loosened. Annabeth pulled it off and stuck her hand inside the cannon. Her fingers touched something cold, smooth and metal. She pulled out a small disc of bronze the size of a tea saucer, etched with delicate letters and illustrations. She decided to examine it later. She thrust it in her pack and turned. Rushing off? Rainer asked. The praetor stood ten feet away, in full battle armour, holding a golden javelin. Her two metal greyhounds growled at her side. Annabeth scanned the area. They were more or less alone. Most of the combat had moved towards the docks. Hopefully her friends had all made it on board. But they'd have to set sail immediately, or risk being overrun. Annabeth had to hurry. Rainer, she said. What happened at Camp Jupiter was Gaia's fault. Eidolons. Possessing spirits. Save your explanations, Rainer said. You'll need them for the trial. The dogs snarled and inched forward. This time, it didn't seem to matter to them that Annabeth was telling the truth. She tried to think of an escape plan. She doubted she could take Rainer in one-on-one -on -one camp combat. With those metal dogs, she stood no chance at all. If you let Gaia drive our camps apart, Annabeth said, the giants have already won. They'll destroy the Romans, the Greeks, the gods, the whole mortal world. You think I don't know that? Rainer's voice was as hard as iron. What choice have you left me? Octavian smells blood. He's whipped the legion into a frenzy, and I can't stop it. Surrender to me. I'll bring you back to New Rome for trial. It won't be fair. You'll be painfully executed, but it may be enough to stop further violence. 
Octavian won't be satisfied, of course, but I think I can convince the others to stand down. It wasn't me. It doesn't matter, Raina snapped. Someone must pay for what happened. Let it be you. It's the better option. Annabeth's skin crawled. Better than what? Use that wisdom of yours, Raina said. If you escape today, we won't follow. I told you, not even a madman would cross the sea to the ancient lands. If Octavian can't have vengeance on your ship, he'll turn his attention to Camp Half-Blood. The Legion will march on your territory. We will raise it and salt the earth. Kill the Romans, she heard her mother urging. They can never be your allies. Annabeth wanted to sob. Camp Half-Blood was the only real home she'd ever known, and in a bid for friendship, she had told Rainer exactly where to find it. She couldn't leave it at the mercy of the Romans and travel halfway around the world. But their quest, and everything she'd suffered to get Percy back, if she didn't go to the ancient lands, it would all mean nothing. Besides, the mark of Athena didn't have to lead to revenge. If I could find the route, her mother had said, the way home. How will you use your reward? Aphrodite had asked. For war or peace? There was an answer. The mark of Athena could lead her there, if she survived. I'm going, she told Raina. I'm following the mark of Athena to Rome. The praetor shook her head. You have no idea what awaits you. Yes, I do, Annabeth said. This grudge between our camps, I can fix it. Our grudge is thousands of years old. How can one person fix it? Annabeth wished she could give a convinc convincing answer. Show Rainer a 3D diagram or a brilliant schematic. But she couldn't. She just knew she had to try. She remembered that, that lost look on her mother's face. I must return home. The quest has to succeed, she said. You can try to stop me, in which case we'll have to fight to the death. Or you can let me go and I'll try to save both our camps. If you must march on Camp Half-Blood, at least try to delay. Slow Octavian down. Raina's eyes narrowed. One daughter of a war goddess to another. I respect your boldness. But if you leave now, you doom your camp to destruction. Don't underestimate Camp Half-Blood, Annabeth warned. You've never seen the Legion at war, Raina countered. Over by the docks, a familiar voice shrieked over the wind. Kill them! Kill them all! Octavian had survived his swim in the harbour. He crouched behind his guards, screaming encouragement as the other, at the other Roman demigods as they struggled towards the ship, holding up their shields as if that would deflect the storm raging all around them. On the deck of the Argo too, Percy and Jason stood together, their swords crossed. Annabeth got a tingle down her spine as she realised the boys were working as one, summoning the sky and the sea to do their bidding. Water and wind churned together. Waves heaved against the ramparts and lightning flashed. Giant eagles were knocked out of the sky. Wreckage of the flying chariot burned in the water and Coach Hedge swung a mounted crossbow, taking pot shots at the Roman birds as they flew overhead. You see, Rainer said bitterly, the spear is thrown. Our people are at war. Not if I succeed, Annabeth said. Rainer's expression looked the same as it had at Camp Jupiter when she realised Jason had found another girl. The praetor was too alone, too bitter and betrayed to believe anything could go right for her ever again. Annabeth waited for her to attack. Instead, Raina flicked her hand. The metal dogs backed away. Annabeth chase, she said. When we meet again, we will be enemies on the field of battle. The praetor turned and walked across the ramparts, her greyhounds behind her. Annabeth feared it might be some sort of trick, but she had no time to wonder. She ran for the ship. The winds that battered the Romans did seem to affect her. They didn't seem to affect her. Annabeth sprinted through their lines. Octavian yelled, Stop her! A spear flew past her ear. Yago too was already pulling away from the dock. Piper was at the gangplank, her hand outstretched. Annabeth leapt and grabbed Piper's hand. The gangplank fell into the sea and the two girls tumbled onto the deck. Go! Annabeth screamed. Go, go, go! The engines rumbled beneath her. The, roar, the oars churned. Jason changed the course of the wind and Percy called up a massive wage, wave which lifted the ship higher than the fort's walls and pushed it out to sea. By the time the Argo 2 reached top speed, Fort Sumter was only a blot in the distance and they were racing across the waves towards the ancient lands. Chapter 21. Leo. After raiding a museum full of confederate ghosts, Leo didn't think his day could get any worse. He was wrong. They hadn't found anything in the Civil War sub or elsewhere in the museum, just a few elderly tourists, a dozing security guard, and when they tried to inspect the artefacts, a whole battalion of glowing zombie dudes in grey uniforms. The idea that Frank should be able to control the spirits, yeah, that pretty much failed. 
By the time Piper sent her Iris message warning them about the Roman attack, they were already halfway back to the ship, having been chased through downtown Charleston by a pack of angry dead Confederates. Then, oh boy, Leo got a hitch, got to hitch a ride with Frank, to the, the friendly eagle, so he could fight a bunch of Romans. Rumour must have got around that Leo was the one who had fired on their little city, because those Romans seemed especially anxious to kill him. But wait, there was more. Coach Hedge shot them out of the sky, Frank dropped him, that was no accident, and they crash-landed in Fort Sumter. Now, as the Argo 2 raced across the waves, Leo had to use all his skill just to keep his ship in one piece. Percy and Jason were a little too good at cooking up massive storms. At one point, Annabeth stood next to him, yelling against the roar of the wind. Percy says he talked to a Nairide in Charleston Harbour. Good for him, Leo yelled back. The Nairide said we should seek help from Chiron's brothers. What does that mean? The party ponies. Leo had never met Chiron's crazy centaur relatives, but he'd heard rumours of nerf sword fights, root beer chugging contests, and super soakers filled with pressurised whipped cream. Not sure, Annabeth said, but I've got coordinates. Can you input latitude and longitude in this thing? I can input star charts and order you a smoothie if you want. Of course I can do latitude and longitude. Annabeth rattled off the numbers. Leo somehow managed to punch them in while holding the wheel with one hand. A red dot popped up on the bronze display screen. That location is in the middle of the Atlantic, he said. Do the party ponies have a yacht? Annabeth shrugged helplessly. Just hold the ship together until we get further from Charleston. Jason and Percy will keep up the winds. Happy fun time! It seemed like forever, but finally the sea calmed and the winds died. Valdez, said Coach Hedge with surprising gentleness. Let me take the wheel. You've been steering for two hours. Two hours? Yeah, give me the wheel. Coach? Yeah, kid. I can't unclench my hands. It was true. Leo's fingers felt like they'd turned to stone. His eyes burned from staring at the horizon. His knees were marshmallows. Coach Hedge managed to prize him from the wheel. Leo took one last look at the console, listening to Festus chatter and whir a status report. Leo felt like he was forgetting something. He stared at the controls, trying to think, but it was no good. His eyes could hardly focus. Just watch for monsters, he told the coach, and be careful with the damage stabilizer and... I've got it covered, Coach Hedge promised. Now go away. Leo nodded wearily. He staggered across the deck towards his friends. Percy and Jason sat with their backs against the mast, their heads slumped in exhaustion. Annabeth and Piper were trying to get them to drink some water. Hazel and Frank stood just out of earshot, having an argument that involved lots of arm-waving and head-shaking. Leo should not have felt pleased about that, but part of him did. The other part of him felt bad that he felt pleased. The argument stopped abruptly when Hazel saw Leo. Everybody gathered at the mast. Frank scowled like he was trying hard to turn into a bulldog. No sign of pursuit, he said. Or land, Hazel added. She looked a little green, though Leo wasn't sure if that was from the rocking of the boat or from arguing. Leo scanned the horizon. Nothing but ocean in every direction. That shouldn't have surprised him. He'd spent six months building a ship that he knew would cross the Atlantic. But until today, after embarking on a journey to the ancient lands, hadn't seemed real. Leo had never been outside the US before, except for a quick dragon flight up to Quebec. Now, they were in the middle of the open sea, completely on their own, sailing to the Mare's Nostrum where all the scary monsters and nasty giants had come from. The Romans might not follow them, but they couldn't count on any help from Camp Half-Blood either. Leo patted his waist to make sure his tool belt was still there. Unfortunately, that just reminded him of Nemesis's fortune cookie, tucked inside one of the pockets. You will always be an outsider. The goddess's voice still wriggled around in his head. The seventh wheel. Forget her, Leo told himself. Con concentrate on the stuff you can fix. He turned to Annabeth. Did you find the map you wanted? She nodded, though she looked pale. Leo wondered what she'd seen at Fort Sumter that could have shaken her up so badly. I'll have to study it, she said, as if that was the end of the subject. How far are we from those coordinates? At top rowing speed, about an hour, Leo said. Any idea what we're looking for? No, she admitted. Percy? Percy, Percy raised his head. His green eyes were bloodshot and droopy. The Nairide said Chiron's brothers were there, and they'd want to hear about that aquarium in Atlanta, I don't know what she meant, but... He paused, like he'd used up all his energy saying that much. She also warned me to be careful. Cato, the goddess at the aquarium. She's the mother of sea monsters. She might be stuck in Atlanta, but she can still send her children after us. The Nairide said we should expect an attack. Wonderful, Frank muttered. Jason tried to stand, which wasn't a good idea. Piper grabbed him to keep him from falling over, and he slid back down the mast. Can we get the ship aloft? he asked. If we could fly... 
That'd be great, Leo said, except Festus tells me the port aerial stabilizer got pulverized when the ship raked against the dock at Fort Sumter. We were in a hurry, Annabeth said, trying to save you. And saving me is very noble cause, uh, Leo agreed. I'm just saying it'll take some time to fix. Until then, we're not flying anywhere. Percy flexed his shoulders and winced. Fine with me. The sea is good. Speak for yourself. Hazel glanced at the evening sun, which was almost to the horizon. We need to go fast. We've burned another day and Nico only has three more left. We can do it, Leo promised. He helped, hoped Hazel had forgiven him for not trusting her brother. Hey, it had seemed like a reasonable suspicion to Leo, but he didn't want to reopen that wound. We can make it to Rome in three days, assuming, you know, nothing unexpected happens. Frank grunted. He looked like he was still working on that bulldog transformation. Is there any good news? Actually, yes, Leo said. According to Festus, our flying table, Buford, made it back safely while we were in Charleston, so those eagles didn't get him. Unfortunately, he lost the laundry bag with your pants. Dang it, Frank barked, which Leo figured was probably severe profanity for him. No doubt Frank would have cursed some more, busting out the golly G's and the gosh darns, but Percy interrupted by doubling over and groaning. Did the world just turn upside down, he asked. Jason pressed his hands to his head. Yeah, and it's spinning. Everything is yellow. Is it supposed to be yellow? Annabeth and Piper exchanged concerned looks. Summoning that storm really sapped your strength, Piper told the boys. You've got to rest. Annabeth nodded agreement. Frank, can you help us get the guys below decks? Frank glanced at Leo, no doubt reluctant to leave him alone with Hazel. It's fine, man, Leo said. Just try not to drop them on the way down the stairs. Once the others were below, Hazel and Leo faced each other awkwardly. They were alone except for Coach Hedge, who was back on the quarterdeck singing the Pokemon theme song. The coach had changed the words to Gotta Kill Em All, and Leo really didn't want to know why. The song didn't seem to help Hazel's nausea. Oh, she leaned over and hugged her sides. She had nice hair, frizzy and golden brown like curls of cinnamon. Her hair reminded Leo of a place in Houston that made excellent churros. The thought made him hungry. Don't lean over, he advised. Don't close your eyes. It makes the queasiness worse. It does? Do you get seasick too? Not seasick, but uh, cars make me nauseous and uh, he stopped himself. He wanted to say, talking to girls, but he decided to keep that to himself. Cars. Hazel straightened with, di straightened with difficulty. You can sail a ship or fly a dragon, but cars make you sick. I know, right? Leo shrugged. I'm special that way. Look, keep your eyes on the horizon. That's a fixed point. It'll help. Hazel took a deep breath and stared into the distance. Her eyes were lustrous gold, like the copper and bronze discs inside Festus's mechanical head. Any better? he asked. Maybe a little. She sounded like she was just being polite. She kept her eyes on the horizon, but Leo got the feeling she was gauging his mood, considering what to say. Frank didn't drop you on purpose, she said. He's not like that. He's just a little clumsy sometimes. Oops, Leo said, and his best Frank Zhang voice dropped Leo into a squad of enemy soldiers. Dang it! Hazel tried to suppress a smile. Leo figured smiling was better than throwing up. Go easy on him, Hazel said. You and your fireballs make Frank nervous. The guy can turn into an elephant and I make him nervous? Hazel kept her eyes on the horizon. She didn't look quite so queasy, despite the fact that Coach Hedge was still singing his Pokemon song at the helm. Leo, she said, about what happened at the Great Salt Lake. Here it comes, Leo thought. He remembered their meeting with the revenge goddess Nemesis. The fortune cookie in his tool belt started to feel heavier. Last night, as they flew from Atlanta, Leo had lain in his cabin and thought about how angry he'd made Hazel. He had thought about ways he could make it right. Soon you will face a problem you cannot solve, Nemesis had said, though I could help you for a price. Leo had taken the fortune cookie out of his tool belt and turned it in his fingers, wondering what price he would have to pay if he broke it open. Maybe now was the moment. I'd be willing, he told Hazel. I could use the fortune cookie to find your brother. Hazel looked stunned. What? No, I mean, I'd never ask you to do that. Not after what Nemesis said about the horrible cost. We barely know each other. The barely know each other comment kind of hurt, though Leo knew it was true. So, that's not what you wanted to talk about, he asked. Uh, did you want to talk about the holding hands on the boulder moment? Because, uh, no she said quickly, fanning her face in that cute way she did when she was flustered. No, I was just thinking about the way you tricked Narcissus and those nymphs. Oh, right. Leo glanced self-consciously at his arm. The hot stuff tattoo hadn't completely faded. Seemed like a good idea at the time. You were amazing, Hazel said. I've been mulling it over. How much you reminded me of... 
Sammy, Leo guessed. I wish you'd tell me who he is. Who he was, Hazel corrected. The evening air was warm, but she shivered. I've been thinking, I might be able to show you. You mean like a photo? No, there's a sort of flashback that happens to me. I haven't had one in a long time, and I've never tried to make one happen on purpose, but I shared one with Frank once, so I thought... Hazel locked eyes with him. Leo started to feel jittery, like he'd been injected with coffee. If this flashback was something Frank had shared with Hazel, well, either Leo didn't want to be any part of it, or he definitely wanted to try it. He wasn't sure which. When you say flashback, he swallowed. What exactly are we talking about? Is it safe? Hazel held out her hand. I wouldn't ask you to do this, but I'm sure it's important. It can't be a coincidence we met. If this works, maybe we can finally understand how we're connected. Leo glanced back at the helm. He still had a nagging suspicion he'd forgotten something, but Coach Hedge seemed to be doing fine. The sky ahead was clear. There was no sign of trouble. Besides, a flashback sounded like a pretty brief thing. It couldn't hurt to let the coach be in charge for a few more minutes, could it? Okay, he relented. Show me. He took Hazel's hand, and the world dissolved. Chapter 22. Leo. They stood in the courtyard of an old compound, like a monastery. Red brick walls were overgrown with vines. Big magnolia trees had cracked the ground. The sun beat down and the humidity was about 200%, even stickier than in Houston. Somewhere nearby, Leo smelled fish frying. Overhead, the cloud was low and grey, striped like a tiger's pelt. The courtyard was about the size of a basketball court. An old deflated football sat in one corner at the base of, the, of a Virgin Mary statue. Along the sides of the buildings, windows were open. Leo could see flickers of movement inside, but it was eerily quiet. He saw no sign of air conditioning, which meant it must have been a thousand degrees in there. Where are we? he asked. My old school, Hazel said next to him. St Agnes's Academy for Coloured Children and Indians. What kind of name? He turned towards Hazel and yelped. She was a ghost, just a vaporous silhouette in the steamy air. Leo looked down and realised his own body had turned to mist too. Everything around him seemed solid and real, but he was a spirit. After having been possessed by an idol on three days ago, he didn't appreciate the feeling. Before he could ask questions, a bell rang inside. Not a modern electronic sound, but the old-fashioned buzz of a hammer on metal. This is a memory, Hazel said. So no one will see us. Look, here we come. We. From every door, dozens of children spilled into the courtyard, yelling and jostling each other. They were mostly African-American, with a sprinkling of Hispanic-looking kids, as young as kindergartners and as old as high schoolers. Leo could tell this was in the past, because all the girls were dre wore dresses and buckled leather shoes. The boys wore white collared shirts and trousers held up by suspenders. Many wore caps, like horse jockeys wear. Some kids carried lunches. Many didn't. Their clothes were clean, but worn and faded. Some had holes in the knees of their trousers, or shoes with the heels coming apart. A few of the girls began a skipping game with an old piece of clothesline. The older guys tossed a ratty baseball back and forth. Kids with lunches sat together and ate and chatted. No one paid Ghost Hazel or Leo any attention. Then Hazel, Hazel from the past, stepped into the courtyard. Leo recognised her with no problem, though she looked about two years younger than now. Her hair was pinned back in a bun. Her gold eyes darted around the courtyard uneasily. She wore a dark dress, unlike the other girls in their white cotton or pastel flowery prints, so she stood out like a mourner at a wedding. She gripped a canvas lunch bag and moved along the wall, as if trying hard not to be noticed. It didn't work. A boy called out, Which girl? He lumbered towards her, backing her into a corner. The boy could have been 14 or 19. It was hard to tell because he was so big and tall, easily the largest guy on the playground. Leo figured he'd been held back a few times. He wore a dirty shirt the colour of grease rags, Fred bare wool trousers. In this heat, they couldn't have been more comfortable. And no shoes at all. Maybe the teachers were too terrified to insist that this kid wear shoes, or maybe he just didn't have any. That's Rufus, said Ghost Hazel with a distaste. Seriously? No way his name is Rufus, Leo said. Come on, said Ghost Hazel. She drifted towards the confrontation. Leo followed. He wasn't used to drifting, but he'd ridden a Segway once and it was kind of like that. He simply leaned in the direction he wanted to go and glided along. The big kid Rufus had flat features, as if he spent most of his time face planting on the sidewalk. His hair was cut just as flat on top, so miniature aeroplanes could have used it for a landing strip. Rufus thrust out his hand. Lunch. Hazel, from the past, didn't protest. She handed over a canvas bag, like this was an everyday occurrence. A few older girls drifted over to watch the fun. One giggled at Rufus. You don't want to eat that, she warned. It's probably poison. 
You're right, Rufus said. Did your witch mum make this, Levesque? She's not a witch, Hazel muttered. Rufus dropped the bag and stepped on it, smashing the contents under his bare heel. You can have it back. I want a diamond, though. I hear your mama can make those out of thin air. Give me a diamond. I don't have diamonds, Hazel said. Go away. Rufus balled his fists. Leo had been in enough rough schools and foster homes to sense when things were about to turn ugly. He wanted to step in and help Hazel, but he was a ghost. Besides, all this had happened decades ago. Then another kid stumbled outside into the sunlight. Leo sucked in his breath. The boy looked exactly like him. You see? asked Ghost Hazel. Fake Leo was the same height as regular Leo, meaning he was short. He had the same nervous energy, tapping his fingers against his trousers, brushing at his white cotton shirt, adjusting the jockey cap on his curly brown hair. Really, Leo thought, short people should not wear jockey caps unless they were jockeys. Fake Leo had the same devilish smile that greeted regular Leo whenever he looked in a mirror, an expression that made teachers immediately shout. Don't even think about it and plop him in the front row. Apparently fake Leo had just been scolded by a teacher. He was holding a dunce cap, an honest-to-goodness cardboard cone that said dunce. Leo thought there was something you could only see in car cartoons. He could understand why fake Leo wasn't wearing it, bad enough to look like a jockey. With that cone on his head, he would have looked like a gnome. Some kids backed up when fake Leo burst onto the scene. Others nudged each other and ran towards him like they were expecting a show. Meanwhile, flat-haired Rufus was still trying to punk Hazel out of a diamond, oblivious to fake Leo's arrival. Come on, girl! Rufus loomed over Hazel with his fists clenched. Give it! Hazel pressed himself, herself against the wall. Suddenly, the ground at her feet went snap, like a twig breaking. A perfect diamond the size of a pistachio glittered between her feet. Ha! Rufus barked when he saw it. He started to lean down, but Hazel yelped. No, please! as if she was genuinely concerned for the big goon. That's when fake Leo strolled over. Here it comes, Leo thought. Fake Leo is going to bust out some Coach Hedge-style jiu-jitsu and save the day. Instead, fake Leo put the top of the dunce cap to his mouth like a megaphone and, and yelled, Cut! He said it with such authority all the other kids momentarily froze. Even Rufus straightened and backed away in confusion. One of the little boys snickered under his breath. Hammy Sammy! Sammy, Leo shivered. Who the heck was this kid? Sammy, fake Leo, stormed up to Rufus with his dunce cap in his hand, looking angry. No, 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 he announced, waving his free hand wildly at other kids who were gathering to watch the entertainment. Sammy turned to Hazel. Miss Lamar, your line is... Sammy looked around in exasperation. Script, what is uh, Hedy Lamar's line? No, please, you villain, one of the boys called out. Thank you, Sammy said. Miss Lamar, you're supposed to say, no, please, you villain, and you, Clark Gable... The whole courtyard burst into laughter. Leo vaguely knew Clark Gable was an old-timey actor, but he didn't know much else. Apparently, though, the idea that Flathead Rufus could be Clark Gable was hilarious to the kids. Mr. Gable! No! One of the girls cried. Make him Gary Cooper! More laughter. Rufus looked as if he were about to blow a valve. His, he balled his fists like he wanted to hit somebody, but he couldn't attack the entire school. He clearly hated being laughed at, but his slow little mind couldn't quite work out what Sammy was up to. Leo nodded in appreciation. Sammy was like him. Leo had done the same kind of stuff to bullies for years. Right, Sammy yelled imperiously. Mr. Cooper, you say? Oh, but the diamond is mine, my treacherous darling. And then you scoop up the diamond like this. Sammy, no, Hazel protested. But Sammy snatched up the stone and slipped it into his pocket in one smooth move. He wheeled on Rufus. I want emotion. I want the ladies in the audience swooning. Ladies, did Mr. Cooper make you swoon just now? No, several of them called back. There, you see, Sammy cried. Now from the top, he yelled into his dunce cap. Action! Rufus was just starting to get over his confusion. He stepped towards Sammy and said, Valdez, I'm gonna... The bell rang. Kids swarmed towards the doors. Sammy pulled Hazel out of the way as the little ones, who acted like they were on Sammy's payroll, herded Rufus along with them, so he was carried out inside on a tide of kindergart kindergartners. Soon, Sammy and Hazel were alone except for the ghosts. Sammy scooped up Hazel's smashed lunch, made a show of dusting off the canvas bag and presented it to her with a deep bow, as if it were her crown, Miss Lamar. Hazel, from the past, took her ruined lunch. She looked like she was about to cry, but Leo couldn't tell if that was from relief or misery or admiration. Sammy, Rufus is going to kill you. Ah, he knows better than to tangle with me. Sammy plopped the dunce cap on top of his jockey cap, he stood up straight and stuck out his scrawny chest. The dunce cap fell off. 
Hazel laughed. You're ridiculous. Why, thank you, Miss Lamar. You're welcome, my treacherous darling. Sammy's smile wavered. The air became uncomfortably charged. Hazel stared at the ground. You shouldn't have touched that diamond. It's dangerous. Ah, oh, come on, Sammy said. Not for me. Hazel studied him warily, like she wanted to believe it. Bad things might happen. You shouldn't. I won't sell it, Sammy said. I promise. I'll just keep it as a token of your flavour. Hazel forced a smile. I think you mean token of my favour. There you are. We should get going. It's time for our next scene. Hedy Lamar nearly dies of boredom in English class. Sammy held out his elbow like a gentleman, but Hazel pushed him away playfully. Thanks for being there, Sammy. Miss Lamar, I will always be there for you, he said brightly. The two of them raced back into the schoolhouse. Leo felt more like a ghost than ever. Maybe he had actually been an Eidolon in his whole, his whole life, because this kid he'd just seen should have been the real Leo. He was smarter, cooler and funnier. He flirted so well with Hazel that he'd obviously stolen her heart. No wonder Hazel had looked at Leo so strangely when they first met. No wonder she had said Sammy with so much feeling. But Leo wasn't Sammy, any more than Flathead Rufus was Clark Gable. Hazel, he said. I, I don't. The schoolyard dissolved into a different scene. Hazel and Leo were still ghosts, but now they stood in front of a, a run-down house, next to a drainage ditch, overgrown with weeds. A clump of banana trees drooped in the yard. Perched on the steps, an old-fashioned radio played conjunto music, and on the shaded porch, sitting in a rocking chair, a skinny old man gazed at the horizon. Where are we? Hazel asked. She was still only vapour, but her voice was full of alarm. This isn't from my life. Leo felt as if his ghostly self was thickening, becoming more real. This place seems strangely familiar. It's Houston, he realised. I know this view, that drainage ditch. This is my mum's old neighbourhood, where she grew up. Hobby Airport is over that way. This is your life, Hazel said. I don't understand. How? You're asking me? Leo demanded. Suddenly the old man murmured. Ah, Hazel. A shock went up Leo's spine. The old man's eyes were still fixed on the horizon. How did he know they were here? I guess we ran out of time, the old man continued dreamily. Well, he didn't finish the thought. Hazel and Leo stayed very still. The old man made no further sign that he saw them or heard them. It dawned on Leo that the guy had been talking to himself. But then, why had he said Hazel's name? He had leathery skin, curly white hair and gnarled hands, like he'd spent a lifetime working in a machine shop. He wore a pale yellow shirt, spotless and clean, with grey slacks and suspenders and polished black shoes. Despite his age, his eyes were sharp and clear. He sat with a kind of quiet dignity. He looked at peace, amused, even like he was thinking. Dang, I love this song. I lived this long? Cool. Leo was pretty sure he had never seen this man before. So why did he seem familiar? Then he realised the man was tapping his fingers on the arm of his chair, but the tapping wasn't random. He was using Morse code, just like Leo's mother used to do with him. And the old man was tapping the same message. I love you. The screen door opened. A young woman came out. She wore jeans and a turquoise blouse. Her hair was cut in a short black wedge. She was pretty, but not delicate. She had, well, had well-muscled arms and calloused hands. Like the old man's, her brown eyes glinted with amusement. In her arms was a baby, wrapped in a blue blanket. Look, mijo, she said to the baby. This is your bisabuelo. Bisabuelo, you want to hold him? When Leo heard her voice, he sobbed. It was his mother. Younger than he remembered her, but very much alive. That meant the baby in her arms. The old man broke into a huge grin. He had perfect teeth as white as his hair. His face crinkled with smile lines. A boy! Mi bebeto! Leo! Leo! Hazel whispered. That... that's you. What is bisabuelo? Leo couldn't find his voice. Great grandfather, he wanted to say. The old man took baby Leo in his arms, chuckling with appreciation and tickling the baby's chin and ghost Leo finally realised what he was seeing. Somehow, Hazel's power to revisit the past had found the one event that connected both of their lives, where Leo's timeline touched Hazel's. This old man. Oh. Hazel seemed to realise who he was at the same moment. Her voice became very small, on the verge of tears. Oh, Sammy. No. Ah, little Leo, said Sammy Valdez, aged well into his seventies. You'll have to be my stunt double, eh? That's what they call it, I think. Tell her for me. I hoped I would be alive, but I, the curse won't have it. Hazel sobbed. Gaia, Gaia told me that he died of a heart attack in the 1960s, but this isn't, this can't be. Sammy Valdez kept talking to the baby, while Leo's mother, Esperanza, 
looked on with a pained smile, perhaps a little worried that Leo's bisabuelo was rambling, a little sad that he was speaking nonsense. That lady, Donna Kelida, she warmed me. She warned me, Sammy. Sammy shook his head sadly. She said Hazel's great danger would not happen in my lifetime, but I promised I would be there for her. You will have to tell her I'm sorry, Leo. Help her if you can. Bisabuelo, Esperanza said. You must be tired. She extended her arms to take the baby, but the old man cuddled him a moment longer. Baby Leo seemed perfectly fine with it. Tell her I'm sorry I sold the diamond, eh? Sammy said. I broke my promise when she disappeared in Alaska. Ah, so long ago. I finally used that diamond, moved to Texas, as I always dreamed. I started my machine shop, started my family. It was a good life, but Hazel was right. The diamond came with a curse. I never saw her again. Oh, Sammy, Hazel said. No, a curse didn't keep me away. I wanted to come back. I died. The old man didn't seem to hear. He smiled down at the baby and kissed him on the head. I give you my blessing, Leo. First male great-grandchild. I have a feeling you are special like Hazel was. You are more than a regular baby, eh? You will carry on for me. You will see her some day. Tell her hello for me. Bisabuelo, Esperanza said, a little more insistently. Yes, yes, Sammy chuckled. El viejo loco rambles on. I am tired, Esperanza. You are right, but I'll rest soon. It's been a good life. Raise him well, Nieta. The scene faded. Leo was standing on the deck of the Argo too, holding Hazel's hand. The sun had gone down and the ship was lit only by bronze lanterns. Hazel's eyes were puffy from crying. What they'd seen was too much. The whole ocean heaved under them, and now for the first time Leo felt as if they were totally adrift. Hello, Hazel Levesque, he said, his voice gravelly. Her chin trembled. She turned away and opened her mouth to speak, but before she could, the ship lurched to one side. Leo! Coach Hedge yelled. Festus whirred in alarm and blew flames into the night sky. The ship's bell rang. Those monsters you were worried about, Hedge shouted. One of them found us. Chapter 23. Leo. Leo deserved a dunce cap. If he'd been thinking straight, he would have switched the ship's detection system from radar to sonar as soon as they left Charleston Harbour. That's what he had forgotten. He designed the hull to resonate every few seconds, sending waves through the mist and alerting Festus to any nearby monsters. But it only worked in one mode at a time, water or air. He'd been so rattled by the Romans, then the storm, then Hazel, that he'd completely forgotten. Now a monster was right underneath them. The ship tilted to starboard. Hazel gripped the rigging. Hedge yelled, Valdez, which button blows up monsters? Take the helm! Leo climbed the tilting deck and managed to grab the port rail. He started clambering sideways towards the helm, but when he saw the monster surface, he forgot how to move. The thing was the length of their ship. In the moonlight, it looked like a cross between a giant shrimp and a cockroach, with a pink chitinous shell, a flat crayfish tail, and millipede-type legs, undulating hypnotically as the monster scraped against the hull of the Argo too. Its head surfaced last, the slimy pink face of an enormous catfish, with glassy dead eyes, a gaping toothless maw, and a forest of tentacles sprouting from each nostril, making the bushiest nose beard Leo had ever had the displeasure to behold. Leo remembered special Friday night dinners he and his mum used to share at a local seafood restaurant in Houston. They would eat shrimp and catfish. The idea now made him want to throw up. Come on, Valdez! Hedge yelled. Take the wheel so I can get my baseball bat! A bat's not going to help, Leo said, but he made his way towards the helm. Behind him, the rest of his friends stumbled up the stairs. Percy yelled. What's going? Gah, shrimp, Zilla! Frank ran to Hazel's side. She was clutching the rigging, still dazed from her flashback, but she gestured that she was all right. The monster rammed the ship again. The hull groaned. Annabeth, Piper and Jason tumbled to starboard and almost rolled overboard. Leo reached the helm. His hands flew across the controls. Over the intercom, Festus clacked and clicked about leaks below decks, but the ship didn't seem to be in danger of sinking, at least not yet. Leo toggled the oars. They could convert into spears, which should be enough to drive the creature away. Unfortunately, they were jammed. Shrimp Zilla must have knocked them out of alignment, and the monster was in spitting distance, which meant that Leo couldn't use the ballast without setting the Argo 2 on fire as well. How did it get so close? Annabeth shouted, pulling herself up onto one of the rail shields. I, I don't know, Hedge nurse snarled. He looked around for his bat, which had rolled across the quarter deck. I'm stupid, Leo scolded himself. Stupid, stupid, I forgot the sonar. The ship tilted further to starboard. 
Either the monster was trying to give them a hug, or it was about to capsize them. Sona, Hedge demanded. Pan's pipes, Valdez. Maybe if you hadn't been staring into Hazel's eyes, holding hands for so long. What? Frank yelped. It wasn't like that, Hazel protested. It doesn't matter, Piper said. Jason, can you call some lightning? Jason struggled to his feet. I, uh... He only managed to shake his head. Summoning the storm earlier had taken too much out of him. Leo doubted the poor guy could pop a spark plug in the shape he was in. Percy, Annabeth said, can you talk to that thing? Do you know what it is? The son of the sea god shook his head, clearly mystified. Maybe it's just curious about the ship. Maybe... The monster's tendrils lashed across the deck so fast Leo didn't even have time to yell, look out. One slammed Percy in the chest and sent him crashing down the steps. Another wrapped around Piper's legs and dragged her, screaming towards the rail. Dozens more tendrils curled around the masts, encircling the crossbows and ripping down the rigging. Nose hair attack! Hedge snatched up his bat and leapt into action, but his, he, his hits just bounced harmlessly off the tendrils. Jason drew his sword. He tried to free Piper, but he was still weak. His gold blade cut through the tendrils with no problem, but faster than he could se sever them, more took their place. Annabeth unsheathed her dagger. She ran through the forest of tentacles, dodging and stabbing at whatever target she could find. Frank pulled out his bow. He fired over the side at the creature's body, lodging arrows in the chinks of its shell, but that only seemed to annoy the monster. It bellowed and rocked the ship. The mast creaked like it might snap off. They needed more firepower, but they couldn't use ballastay. They needed to deliver a blast that wouldn't destroy the ship. But how? Leo's eyes fixed on a supply crate next to Hazel's feet. Hazel, he yelled. That box, open it. She hesitated and then saw the box he meant. The label read, warning, do not open. Open it, Leo yelled again. Coach, take the wheel. Turn us towards the monster or we'll capsize. Hedge danced through the ten tentacles with his nimble goat hooves, smashing away with gusto. He bounded towards the helm and took the controls. Hope you got a plan, he shouted. A bad one. Leo raced towards the mast. The monster pushed against the Argo too. The deck lurched to 45 degrees. Despite everyone's efforts, the tentacles were just too numerous to fight. They seemed able to elongate as much as they wanted. Soon they'd have the Argo too completely entangled. Percy hadn't appeared from below. The others were fighting for their lives against nose hair. Frank, Leo called as he ran towards Hazel. Buy us some time. Can you turn into a shark or something? Frank glanced over, scowling, and in that moment a tentacle slammed into the big guy, knocking him overboard. Hazel screamed. She'd opened the supply box and almost dropped the two glass vials she was holding. Leo caught them. Each was the size of an apple, and the liquid inside glowed, po glowed poisonous green. The glass was warm to touch. Leo's chest felt like it might implode from guilt. he just distracted Frank and possibly got him killed, but he couldn't think about it. He had to save the ship. Come on. He handed Hazel one of the vials. We can kill the monster and save Frank. He hoped he wasn't lying. Getting to the port rail was more like rock climbing than walking, but finally they made it. What is this stuff? Hazel gasped, cradling her glass vial. Greek fire. Her eyes widened. Are you crazy? If these break, we'll burn the whole ship. It's mouth, Leo said. Just chuck it down its... Suddenly Leo was crushed against Hazel and the world turned sideways. As they were lifted into the air, he realised they'd been wrapped together in a tentacle. Leo's arms were free, but it was all he could do to keep hold of the Greek fire vial. Hazel struggled. Her arms were pinned, which meant at any moment the vial trapped between them might break, and that would be extremely bad for their health. They rose ten feet, twenty feet, thirty feet above the monster. Leo caught a glimpse of his friends in a losing battle, yelling and slashing at the monster's nose hairs. He saw Coach Hedge struggling to keep the ship from capsizing. The sea was dark, but in the moonlight he thought he saw a glistening object floating near the monster. Maybe the unconscious body of Frank Zhang. Leo, Hazel gasped. I, I can't. My arms. Hazel, he said. Do you trust me? No. Me neither, Leo admitted. When this thing drops us, hold your breath. Whatever you do, try to chuck your vial as far away from the ship as possible. Why? Why would it drop us? Leo stared down at the monster's head. This would be a tough shot, but he had no choice. He raised the vial in his left hand. He pressed his right hand against the tentacle and summoned fire to his palm. A narrowly focused, white-hot burst. That got the creature's attention. A tremble went all the way down the tentacle as its flesh blistered under Leo's touch. The monster raised its maw, bellowing in pain, and Leo threw his Greek fire straight down its throat. After that, things got fuzzy. Leo felt the tentacle release them. 
They fell. He heard a muffled explosion and saw a green flash of light inside the giant pink lampshade of the monster's body. The water hit Leo's face like a brick wrapped in sandpaper and he sank into darkness. He clamped his mouth shut, trying not to breathe, but he could feel himself losing consciousness. Through the sting of the salt water, he thought he saw the hazy silhouette of the ship's hull above, a dark oval surrounded by a green fiery corona, but he couldn't tell if the ship was actually on fire. Killed by a giant shrimp, Leo thought bitterly. At least let the Argo 2 survive, let my friends be okay. His vision began to dim, his lungs burned. Just as he was about to give up, a strange face hovered over him, a man who looked like Chiron, their trainer back at Camp Halfblood. He had the same curly hair, shaggy beard and intelligent eyes, a look somewhere between wild hippie and fatherly professor, except this man's skin was the colour of a lima bean. The man silently held up a dagger. His expression was grim and reproachful, as if to say, now, hold still, or I can't kill you properly. Leo blacked out. When Leo woke, he wondered if he was a ghost in another flashback because he was floating weightlessly. His eyes slowly adjusted to the dim light. About time, Frank's voice had too much reverb like he was speaking through several layers of plastic wrap. Leo sat up, or rather he drifted upright. He was underwater, in a cave about the size of a two-car garage. Phosphorescent moss covered the ceiling, bathing the room in a blue and green glow. The floor was a carpet of sea urchins, which would have been uncomfortable to walk on, so Leah was glad he was floating. He didn't understand how he could be breathing with no air. Frank levitated nearby in meditation position. With his chubby face and his grumpy expression, he looked like a Buddha who'd achieved enlightenment and wasn't thrilled about it. The only exit to the cave was blocked by a massive abalone shell, its surface glistening in pearl and rose and turquoise. If this cave was a prison, at least it had an awesome door. Where are we? Leo asked. Where is everyone else? Everyone, Frank grumbled. I don't know. As far as I can tell, it's just you and me and Hazel down here. The fish horse guys took Hazel about an hour ago, leaving me with you. Frank's tone made it obvious he didn't approve of those arrangements. He didn't look injured, but Leo realised that he no longer had his bow or quiver. In a panic, Leo patted his waist. His tool belt was gone. They searched us, Frank said. Took anything that could be a weapon. Who? Leo demanded. Who are these fish horse... Fish horse guys? Frank clarified, which wasn't very clear. They must have grabbed us when we fell in the ocean and dragged us. Wherever this is. Leo remembered the last thing he'd seen before he passed out. The lima bean coloured face of a bearded man with a dagger. The shrimp monster. The Argo too. Is the ship okay? I don't know, Frank said darkly. The others might be in trouble or hurt, or, or worse, but I guess you care more about your ship than your friends. Leo felt like his face had just hit the water again. What kind of stupid thing? Then he realised why Frank was so angry. The flashback. Things had happened so fast with the monster attack that Leo had almost forgotten. Coach Hedger had made that stupid comment about Leo and Hazel holding hands and gazing into each other's eyes. It probably hadn't helped that Leo had got Frank knocked overboard right after that. Suddenly, Leo found it hard to meet Frank's gaze. Look, man, I'm sorry. I got, I got us into this mess. I totally jacked things up. He took a deep breath, which felt surprisingly normal, considering he was underwater. Me and Hazel holding hands. It's not what you think. She was showing me this flashback from her past, trying to figure out my connection with Sammy. Frank's angry expression started to unknot, replaced by curiosity. Did she? Did you figure it out? Yeah, Leo said. Well, sort of. We didn't get a chance to talk about it afterwards because of Shrimpzilla, but... Sammy was my great-grandfather. He told Frank what they'd seen. The weirdness hadn't fully registered yet, but now, trying to explain it aloud, Leo could hardly believe it. Hazel had been sweet on his bisabuelo, a guy who had died when Leo was a baby. Leo hadn't made the connection before, but he had a vague memory of older family members calling his grandfather father, Sam Jr., which meant Sam Sr. was Sammy, Leo's bisabuelo. At some point, Tia Kalida, Hira herself, had talked with Sammy, consoling him and giving him a glimpse into the future, which meant that Hira had been shaping Leo's life generations before he was ever born. If Hazel had stayed in the 1940s, if she'd married Leo, Leo might have been her great-grandson. Oh man, Leo said when he had finished the story, I don't feel so good, but I swear on the sticks that's what we saw. Frank had the same expression as the monster catfish head, wide glassy eyes and an open mouth. Hazel? Hazel liked your great-grandfather. That's why she likes you. Frank, I know this is weird. Believe me, but I don't like Hazel. Not that way. I'm not moving in on your girl. Frank knitted his eyebrows. No? Leo hoped he wasn't blushing. Truthfully, he had no idea how he felt about Hazel. 
She was awesome and cute, and Leo had a weakness for awesome, cute girls, but the flashback had complicated his feelings a lot. Besides, his ship was in trouble. I guess you care more about your ship than your friends, Frank had said. That wasn't true, was it? Leo's dad, Hephaestus, had admitted once that he wasn't good with organic life forms, and yes, Leo had always been more comfortable with machines than people. But he did care about his friends, Piper and Jason. He'd known them the longest, but the others were important to him too. Even Frank. They were like family. The problem was, it had been so long since Leo had had a family, he couldn't even remember how it felt. Sure, last winter, he'd become senior counsellor of Hephaestus' cabin, but most of his time had been spent building the ship. He liked his cabin mates. He knew how to work with them. But did he, did he really know them? If Leo had a family, it was the demigods on the Argo too, and maybe Coach Hedge, which Leo would never admit aloud. You will always be the outsider, warned Nemesis's voice. But Leo tried to push that thought aside. Right, so, he looked around him. We need to make a plan. How are we breathing? If we're under the ocean, shouldn't we be crushed by the water pressure? Frank shrugged. Fish horse magic, I guess. I remember the green guy touching my head with the point of a dagger, and then I could breathe. Leo studied the abalone door. Can you bust us out? Turn into a hammerhead shark or something? Frank shook his head glumly. My shapeshifting doesn't work. I don't know why. Maybe they cursed me, or maybe I'm too messed up to focus. Hazel could be in trouble, Leo said. We've got to get out of here. He swam to the door and ran his fingers along the abalone. He couldn't feel any kind of latch or other mechanism. Either the door could only be opened by magic or sheer force was required, neither of which was Leo's speciality. I've already tried, Frank said. Even if we get out, we have no weapons. Hmm. Leo held up his hand. I wonder. He concentrated and fire flickered over his fingers. For a split second, Leo was excited because he hadn't expected it to work underwater. Then his plan started working a little too well. Fire raced up his arm and over his body until he was completely shrouded in a thin veil of flame. He tried to breathe, but he was inhaling pure heat. Leo! Frank flailed backwards like he was falling off a bar stool. Instead of racing to Leo's aid, he hugged the wall to get as far away as possible. Leo forced himself to stay calm. He understood what was going on. The fire itself couldn't hurt him. He willed the flames to die and counted to five. He took a shallow breath. He had oxygen again. Frank stopped trying to merge with the cave wall. You, you're okay? Yeah, Leo grumbled. Thanks for the assist. I, I'm sorry. Frank looked so horrified and ashamed it was hard for Leo to stay mad at him. I just, what happened? Clever magic, Leo said. There's a thin layer of oxygen around us, like an extra skin. Must be self-regenerating. That's how we're breathing and staying dry. The oxygen gave the fire fuel, except the fire also suffocated me. I, uh, I really don't, Frank gulped. I don't like the, that fire, mm, fire summoning you do. He started getting cosy with the wall again. Leo didn't mean to, but he couldn't help laughing. Man, I'm not going to attack you. Fire, Frank repeated, like that one word explained everything. Leo remembered what Hazel had said, that his fire made Frank nervous. He'd seen the discomfort in Frank's face before, but Leo hadn't taken it seriously. Frank seemed way more powerful and scary than Leo was. Now it occurred to him that Frank might have had a bad experience with fire. Leo's own mum had died in a machine shop blaze. Leo had been blamed for it. He'd grown up being called a freak, an arsonist, because whenever he got angry, things burned. Sorry I laughed, he said, and he meant it. My mum died in a fire. I understand being afraid of it. Did a, did something like that happen with you? Frank seemed to be weighing up how much to say. My house, my grandmother's place, it burned down, but it's more than that. He stared at the sea urchins on the floor. Annabeth said I could trust the crew, even you. Even me, huh? Leo wondered how that had come up in conversation. Wow, high praise. My weakness. Frank started, like the words cut his mouth. There's this piece of firewood. The abalone door rolled open. Leo turned and found himself face to face with Lima Bean Man, who wasn't actually a man at all. Now that Leo could see him clearly, the guy was by far the weirdest creature he'd ever met, and that was saying a lot. From the waist up, he was more or less human. A thin, bare-chested dude with a dagger in his belt and a band of seashells strapped across his chest like a bandolier. His skin was green, his beard scraggly brown, and his longish hair was tied back in a seaweed bandana. A pair of lobster claws stuck up from his head like horns, turning and snapping at random. Leo decided he didn't look so much like Chiron. He looked more like the poster Leo's mum used to keep in her workspace, that old Mexican bandit Pancho Villa, except with seashells and lobster horns. From the waist down, the guy was more complicated. He had the forelegs of a, of a blue-green horse, sort of like a centaur, 
but towards the back his horse body morphed into a long fishy tail about ten foot long with a rainbow coloured v-shaped tail fin. Now Leo understood what Frank meant about fish horse guys. I am Bifos, said the green man. I will interrogate Frank Zhang. His voice was calm and firm, leaving no room for debate. Why did you capture us? Leo demanded. Where's Hazel? Bifos narrowed his eyes. His expression seemed to say, did this tiny creature just talk to me? You, Leo Valdez, will go with my brother. Your brother? Leo realised that a much larger figure was looming behind Bifos, with a shadow so wide it filled the entire cave entrance. Yes, Bifos said with a dry smile. Try not to make Athros mad. Chapter 24. Leo. Athros looked like his brother, except he was blue instead of green and much, much bigger. He had Arnold as Terminator abs and arms and a square brutish head. A huge Conan-approved sword was strapped across his back. Even his hair was bigger. A massive globe of blue-black frizz, so thick that his lobster claw horns appeared to be drowning as they tried to swim their way to the surface. Is that why they named you Athros? Leo asked as they glided down the pave from the cave. Because of the Afro. Afros scowled. What do you mean? Nothing, Leo said quickly. At least he would never have trouble remembering which fish dude was which. So what are you guys exactly? If you're centaurs, Afros said, like it was a question he was tired of answering. Uh, icky what? Fish centaurs. We are the half-brothers of Chiron. Oh, he's a friend of mine. Afros narrowed his eyes. The one called Hazel told us this, but we will determine the truth. Come. Leo didn't like the sound of determine the truth. It made him think of torture racks and red-hot pokers. He followed the fish centaur through a massive forest of kelp. Leo could have darted to one side and got lost in the plants pretty easily, but he didn't try. For one thing, he figured Afros could travel much faster in the water, and the guy might be able to shut off the magic that let Leo move and breathe. Inside or outside the cave, Leo was just as much a captive. Also, Leo had knew no clue where he was. They drifted between rows of kelp as tall as apartment buildings. The green and yellow plants swayed weightlessly, like columns of helium balloons. High above, Leo saw a smudge of white that might have been the sun. He guessed that meant they'd been here overnight. Was the Argo 2 all right? Had it sailed on without them? Or were their friends still searching? Leo couldn't even be sure how deep they were. Plants could grow here. Not too deep, right? Still, he knew he couldn't just swim for the surface. He'd heard about people who ascended too quickly and developed nitrogen bubbles in their blood. Leo wanted to avoid carbonated blood. They drifted along for maybe half a mile. Leo was tempted to ask where Afros was taking him, but the big sword strapped to the centaur's back sort of discouraged conversation. Finally, the kelp forest opened up. Leo gasped. They were standing, or swimming, or whatever, at the summit of a high underwater hill. Below them stretched an entire town of Greek-style buildings on the sea floor. The roofs were tiled with mother of pearl. The gardens were filled with coral and sea anemones. Hippocampi grazed in a field of seaweed. A team of cyclopses was placing the domed roof on a new temple, using a blue whale as a crane, and swimming through the streets, hanging out in the courtyards, practicing combat with tridents and swords in the arena, with dozens of mermen and mermaids. Honest to goodness, fish people. Leo had seen a lot of crazy stuff, but he had always thought mer people were silly fictional creatures like Smurfs or Muppets. There was nothing silly or cute about these mer people, though. Even from a distance, they looked fierce and not at all human. Their eyes glowed yellow. They had shark-like teeth and leathery skin in colours ranging from coral red to ink black. It's a training camp, Leo realised. He looked at Afros in awe. You train heroes, the same way Chiron does. Afros nodded, a glint of pride in his eyes. We have trained all the famous mer heroes. Name a mer hero and we have trained him or her. Oh, sure, Leo said, like, um, uh, the little mermaid? Afros frowned. Who? No, like Triton, Glaucus, Weissmuller and Bill. Oh, Leo had no idea why any, who any of these people were. You trained Bill. Uh, impressive. Indeed. Afros pounded his chest. I trained Bill myself, a great merman. You teach combat, I guess. Afros threw up his hands in exasperation. Why does everyone assume that? Leo glanced at the massive sword on the fish guy's back. Uh, I don't know. I teach music and poetry, Afros said. Life skills, homemaking. These are important for heroes. Absolutely. Leo tried to keep a straight face. Sewing? Uh, cookie baking? Yes, I'm glad you understand. Perhaps later, if I don't have to kill you, I will share my brownie recipe. Afros gestured behind him contemptuously. My brother, Bifos, he teaches combat. 
Leo wasn't sure whether he felt relieved or insulted that the combat trainer was interrogating Frank, while Leo got the home economics teacher. So, great, uh, this is camp. What do you call it? Camp fish blood? Afros frowned. I hope that's a joke. This is a camp. This is camp... He made a sound that was a series of sonar pings and hisses. Silly me, Leo said. And, you know, I could really go for some of those brownies. So what do we have to get to the not killing me stage? Tell me your story, Afros said. Leo hesitated, but not for long. Somehow he sensed that he should tell the truth. He started at the beginning. How Hira had been his babysitter and placed him in the flames. How his mother had died because of Gaia, who had identified Leo as a future enemy. He talked about how he had spent his childhood bouncing around in foster homes until he and Jason and Piper had ta been taken to Camp Halfblood. He explained the prophecy of Seven, the building of the Argo II, and their quest to reach Greece and defeat the giants before Gaia woke. As he talked, Afros drew some wicked-looking metal spikes from his belt. Leo was afraid he had said something wrong, but Afros pulled some seaweed yarn from his pouch and started knitting. Go on, he urged. Don't stop. By the time Leo had explained the Eidolons, the problem with the Romans and all the troubles the Argo II had encountered crossing the United States and embarking from Charleston, Afros had knitted a complete baby bonnet. Leo waited while the fish centaur put away his supplies. Afros's lobster claw horns kept swimming around in his thick hair, and Leo had to resist the urge to try to rescue them. Very well, Afros said. I believe you. As simple as that? I am quite good at discerning lies. I hear none from you. Your story also fits with what Hazel Levesque told us. Is she? Of course, Afros said. She's fine. He put his fingers to his mouth and whistled, which sounded strange underwater, like a dolphin screaming. My people will bring her, her here shortly. You must understand, our location is a carefully guarded secret. You and your friends showed up in a warship pursued by one of Kato's sea monsters. We did not know whose side you were on. Is the ship all right? Damaged, Afros said, but not terribly. The Skylopendra withdrew after it got a mouthful of fire. Nice touch. Thank you, uh, Skylopendra. Never heard of it. Consider yourself lucky. They are nasty creatures. Kato must really hate you. At any rate, we rescued you and the other two from the creature's tentacles as it retreated into the deep. Your friends are still above searching for you, but we have obscured their vision. We had to be sure you were not a threat. Otherwise, we would have had to uh, take measures. Leo gulped. He was pretty sure taking measures did not mean baking extra brownies. And if these guys were so powerful that they could keep their camp hidden from Percy, who had all these Poseidonish water powers, they were not fish dudes to mess with. So, we can go? Soon, Afros promised. I must check with Bifos when he is done talking with your friend Gank. Frank. Frank. When they are done, we will send you back to your ship, and we may have some warnings for you. Warnings? Ah, Afros pointed. Hazel emerged from the kelp forest, escorted by two vicious-looking mermaids who were bearing their fangs and hissing. Leo thought Hazel might be in danger. Then he saw she was completely at ease, grinning and talking with her escorts, and Leo realised that the mermaids were laughing. Leo! Hazel padded towards it, paddled towards him. Isn't this place amazing? They were left alone at the ridge, which must have meant Afros really did trust them. While the centaur and the mermaids went off to fetch Frank, Leo and Hazel floated above the hill and gazed down at the underwater camp. Hazel told him how the mermaids had warmed up to her right away. Afros and Bifos had been fascinated by her story, as they had never met a child of Pluto before. On top of that, they had heard many legends about the horse Arion, and they were amazed that Hazel had befriended him. Hazel had promised to visit again with Arion. The mermaids had written their phone numbers in waterproof ink on Hazel's arm so that she could keep in touch. Leo didn't even want to ask how mermaids got cell phone coverage in the middle of the Atlantic. As Hazel talked, her hair floated around her face in a cloud, like brown earth and gold dust in a miner's pan. She looked very sure of herself, and very beautiful, not at all like the shy, nervous girl in that New Orleans schoolyard with her smashed canvas lunch bag at her feet. We didn't get to talk, Leo said. He was reluctant to bring up the subject, but he knew this might be their only chance to be alone. I mean about Sammy. Her smile faded. I know. I just need some time to let it sink in. It's strange to think that you and he... She didn't need to finish the thought. Leo knew exactly how strange it was. I'm not sure I can explain this to Frank, she added, about you and me holding hands. She wouldn't meet Leo's eyes. Down in the valley, the Cyclopses' work crew, work crew cheered as the temple roof was set in place. I talked to him, Leo said. I told him I wasn't trying to, you know, make trouble between you two. Oh, oh, good. Did she sound disappointed? Leo wasn't sure, and he wasn't sure he wanted to know. 
Frank um, seemed pretty freaked out when I summoned fire, Leo explained. What had happened in the cave? Hazel looked stunned. Oh no, that would terrify him. Her hand went to her denim jacket like she was checking for something in the inside pocket. She always wore that jacket, or some sort of overshirt, even when it was hot outside. Leo had assumed that she did it out of modesty or because it was better for horseback riding, like a motorcycle jacket. Now he began to wonder. His brain shifted into high gear. He remembered what Frank had said about his weakness. A piece of firewood. He thought about why this kid would have a fear of fire and why Hazel would be so attuned to those feelings. Leo thought about some of the stories he'd heard at Camp Halfblood. For obvious reasons, he tended to pay attention to legends about fire. Now he remembered one he hadn't thought about in months. There was an old legend about a hero, he recalled. His lifeline was tied to a stick in a fireplace. And when that piece of wood burned up... Hazel's expression turned dark. Leo knew he'd struck on the truth. Frank has that problem, he guessed. And the piece of firewood. He pointed at Hazel's jacket. He gave it to you for safekeeping? Leo, please don't. I can't talk about it. Leo's instincts as a mechanic kicked in. He started thinking about the properties of wood and the corrosiveness of salt water. Is the firewood okay in the ocean like this? Does the layer of air around you protect it? It's fine, Hazel said. The wood didn't even get wet. Besides, it's wrapped up in several layers of cloth and plastic and... She bit her lip in frustration. And I'm not supposed to talk about it. Leo, the point is, if Frank seems afraid of you or uneasy, you've got to understand. Leo was glad he was floating because he probably would have been too dizzy to stand. He imagined being in Frank's position, his life so fragile it literally could burn up at any time. He imagined how much trust it would take to give his lifeline, his entire fate, to another person. Frank had chosen Hazel, obviously, so when he had seen Leo, a guy who could summon fire at will, moving in on his girl. Leo shuddered. No wonder Frank didn't like him. And suddenly Frank's ability to turn into a bunch of different animals didn't seem so awesome. Not if it came with a big catch like that. Leo thought about his least favourite line in the prophecy of Seven. To storm or fire, the world must fall. For a long time he'd figured that Jason or Percy stood for storm. Maybe both of them together. Leo was the fire guy. Nobody said that, but it was pretty clear. Leo was one of the wild cards. If he did the wrong thing, the world would fall. No, it must fall. Leo wondered if Frank and his firewood had something to do with that line. Leo had already made some epic mistakes. It would be so easy for him to accidentally send Frank Zhang up in flames. There you are. Bifos's voice made Leo flinch. Bifos and Afros floated over with Frank between them, looking pale but okay. Frank studied Hazel and Leo carefully, as if trying to read what they'd been talking about. You are free to go, Bifos said. He opened his saddlebags and returned their confiscated supplies. Leo had never been so glad to fit his tool belt around his waist. Tell Percy Jackson not to worry, Afro Afros said. We have understood your story about the imprisoned sea creatures in Atlanta. Cato and Forces must be stopped. We will send a quest of Myrrh heroes to defeat them and free their captives. Perhaps Cyrus. Or Bill, Bifos offered. Yes, Bill would be perfect, Afros agreed. At any rate, we are grateful that Percy brought this to our attention. You should talk to him in person, Leo suggested. I mean, son of Poseidon and all. Both fish centaurs shook their heads solemnly. Sometimes it is best not to interact with Poseidon's brood. Afros said, we are friendly with the sea god, of course, but the politics of undersea deities is complicated, and we value our independence. Nevertheless, tell Percy thank you. We will do what we can to speed you safely across the Atlantic without further interference from Cato's monsters. But be warned, in the ancient sea, the Mare Nostrum, more dangers await. Frank sighed. Naturally. Bifos clapped the big guy on the shoulder. You'll be fine, Frank Zhang. Keep practicing those sea life transformations. The koi fish is good, but try for a Portuguese man of war. Remember what I showed you. It's all in the breathing. Frank looked mortally embarrassed. Leo bit his lip, determined not to smile. And you, Hazel, Afros said, come visit again and bring that horse of yours. I know you are concerned about the time you lost, spending the night in our realm. You are worried about your brother, Nico. Hazel gripped her cavalry sword. Is he? Do you know where he is? Afros shook his head. Not exactly, but when you get closer, you should be able to sense his presence. Never fear, you must reach Rome the day after tomorrow if you are to save him. But there is still time, and you must save him. Yes, Bifos agreed. He will be essential for your journey. I am not sure how, but I sense it is true. Afros planted his hand on Leo's shoulder. As for you, Leo Valdez, stay close to Hazel and Frank when you reach Rome. I sense they will face uh, mechanical difficulties that only you can overcome. Mechanical difficulties? Leo asked. 
Afros smiled as if that was great news. And I have gifts for you. The brave navigator of the Argo too. I like to think of myself as captain, Leo said, or supreme commander. Brownies, Afros said proudly, shoving an old-fashioned picnic basket into Leo's arms. It was surrounded by a bubble of air, which Leo hoped would keep the brownies from turning into saltwater fudge sludge. In this basket, you will also find the recipe. Not too much butter. That's the trick. And I've given you a letter of intro introduction to Tiberinus, the god of the Tiber River. Once you reach Rome, your friend, the daughter of Athena, will need this. Annabeth, Leo said. Okay, but why? Bifos laughed. She follows the mark of Athena, doesn't she? Tiberinus can guide her in this quest. He's an ancient, proud god who can be difficult, but letters of introduction are everything to Roman spirits. This will convince Tiberinus to help her. Hopefully. Hopefully, Leo repeated. Bifos produced three small pink pearls from his saddlebags. And now off with you demigods, good sailing. He threw a pearl at each of them in turn, and three shimmering pink bubbles of energy formed around them. They began to rise through the water. Leo just had time to think. A hamster ball elevator and then he gained speed and rocketed towards the distant glow of the sun above.